Children ages uh, four and five are dismissed to Children's Church with Miss Judy back there. And the rest of you, you know where we are. We're in Matthew chapter five. Matthew chapter five. Today is verse six. We are in the Beatitudes. We've been in the Beatitudes the last few weeks. Uh, the Beatitudes, for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, are, are teachings that Jesus uh, essentially opened up the Sermon on the Mount with. The Sermon on the Mount is the most important sermon ever given of all time from the greatest pastor of all time, Jesus himself. And he opened up the Sermon on the Mount with the first beatitude, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, which led into the second beatitude, which is blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The third one, which we covered last week, is blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And if you missed any of those messages, I'd encourage you to get online and watch them because each beatitude is really only understood completely uh, when you understand the one that comes before it. One kind of leads into the next. There, there's a, a, a unified progression there. And, and today we're on the fourth one. We're on the fourth beatitude. We're about halfway through this series. And this is what Jesus said. We'll get right into it. For this fourth beatitude, he says, blessed are are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed or approved by God, that was that word. Approved by God are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That is what Jesus said. And we've hit a uh, very particular peak with this, with this beatitude this morning. It represents kind of a new tide in the uh, in the life of the believer. If you look on the back of your sermon insert, there's a little chart here that I have provided for you, and I want you to keep that too because I think it's an important way to explain these Beatitudes. But uh, the first three Beatitudes, they're listed over on the left-hand side, and they're listed in order of the way that Jesus said them, and it shows, you know, the arrows are supposed to, to, to show how one leads into another. You know, poor in spirit, having poverty in spirit means uh, that, that, that you recognize your, your sinful nature, and that leads into mourning, which is mourning over your sinful nature, which leads into meekness, right? And so we, we, we have those three that we've already covered, and we call those the Beatitudes of Need. They show us our emptiness before God. There are Beatitudes of Need. And so God blesses those who recognize their emptiness and grieve over it and don't try to justify it and, and defend themselves. And the follow-up to that, to being empty is found in today's beatitude. This is where God fills us up. This is, again, a new tide in, in the beatitudes. We hunger and thirst for righteousness and will be satisfied. We long to be filled with righteousness. This is the blessed place to be because this is where attitude meets lifestyle. It meets action, right? Poor in spirit, mourning and meekness go into the machine of righteousness here in, the, in this, this middle section, and they come out the other side in the form of action. Once we're full, there's evidence of, there's evidence of our fullness, our righteousness, essentially, in our righteous actions, and I'll explain what all that means here in a little bit. You'll see on the right-hand side the action or the overflow. You have merciful, pure in heart, and uh, to be a peacemaker. Those are, those are the things that flow out of righteousness. And so we need to look at that, that, that middle term today, that, that righteousness, what it means to be filled up, because this fourth beatitude is the gateway to the fifth, sixth, and seventh beatitudes. So we need to understand this. We need to, to get to the nitty-gritty of, of what Jesus is talking about here. And really what he's talking about here is our, our, our appetites, uh, the, the blessed appetite, essentially. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. A lot of you have probably heard the term, you are what you eat. You've heard that term before. And it's, it simply means that your lifestyle and your diet, uh, your, your, your diet choices impact your health, right? They impact your health and your well-being. That's what you are, what, you're eat, what you eat is supposed to mean. And in the realm of the spirit, you are what you eat takes on a much more important meaning. It's not just an idiom, and I, I believe it to be true that if you feed on things like violence, if you feed on things like, like materialism, at some point you're going to personify those things. What you feed on, you eventually personify. It becomes your life. Just out of curiosity, has anybody been to the theater recently and seen the new Elvis movie that came out? A couple of you? I hear it's all right, anyway. And I don't want to take away from Elvis's talent, because he, he was an incredibly talented musician. I don't want to take away from, from his contributions to the, to the music industry, 
but it's very easy to see that his life was kind of a miserable pursuit of materialism and sensuality. It's estimated, especially in the regard of materialism, uh, it's estimated that, that in the first two years of Elvis' stardom, he grossed somewhere around $100 million, which is just an enormous amount of money. Uh, that's a lot of money. And he showed it. I mean, if you look at his, his garage, what he had in his garage, I was, I was reading this from, from another author. He states that Elvis had three personal private jets of his own. He had a couple of Cadillacs. He had a Rolls Royce. He had a Lincoln Continental. He had... Uh, Buick and Chrysler station wagons. Uh, he had a Jeep, a dune buggy, a converted bus, and three motorcycles. But his favorite vehicle, they say, was his 1960 Cadillac limousine. That was his favorite vehicle. And I, I want you to look at this thing. I don't know if you can see it very well on the screen here, but those are the best pictures I could come up with. The roof of that thing, it's covered with pearl white naga hide. The body is sprayed with 40 coats of this specially prepared paint that includes crushed diamonds and fish scales. Nearly all of the metal trim on the inside is, is plated. Some say it was 18 karat gold, others are saying it's 24 karat gold. Uh, inside the limo were two gold flake phones, a gold vanity case containing gold, uh, a gold electric razor, gold uh, uh, clippers. Um, he had an electric shoe buffer in there. He had, you can kind of see it there, uh, shining in the left-hand corner, a, a gold-plated TV in there. He had a record player. He had an amplifier. He had a fridge. He had everything he could think of in that limousine. His, his point was, if I don't get to drive it, I want to be comfortable in the back seat. I want all my stuff back here. And it's so ridiculous, the stuff that he included back there, that he's kind of become like this self-parody. It's, it's just it's goofy, all this stuff. But beyond his materialism, his, his sensuality w was legendary, and we don't, I don't think we really need to go there. We've all, we've, we all know who Elvis is, but the people who were closest to Elvis near the end of his life revealed that Elvis had truly become a victim of his own appetites. His story, Elvis' story, really is just a 42-year tragedy is what it is. And his life, as one author puts it, dramatizes the significance of Jesus' teaching in the fourth beatitude. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor. Jesus is using a metaphor to communicate to his audience here. And this metaphor to us is pretty much a dead metaphor because we live in a very prosperous land. This doesn't hit us the same way it, it, it hit them, right? We don't have, we, we don't struggle with with you know, where are we going to find water? Where are we going to find food? We have plenty of water. We have an excess of food most of the time, right? Most of us have no idea what it truly means to hunger and thirst, not in the sense that Jesus is speaking. In the sense that he's speaking, he's saying a desperate hunger, a desperate hunger, a desperate thirst. And I don't, I, I really don't have much of an idea of what this feels like. I, I don't even know if I've ever really seen a desperate hunger. The closest I got is I think last summer we had, uh, uh, I met this little neighbor girl um, who, who told us that she could not wait for school to start up because then she gets to eat more meals every day. She, doesn't, she, she maybe gets to eat once a day. On the weekends, she hardly gets anything. Uh, and, and one day I was sitting in my chair, just sitting in my recliner, and she didn't knock, didn't ring the doorbell. She just opens the door. She goes up to my counter. She grabs some fruit, and then she left. Didn't say a word, just grabbed some food and, and left. I thought, I'm, it's okay. She could, she could take that. And I think of her situation, and yet I still don't think that that's quite the idea yet of what Jesus is talking about. That's not quite desperate enough of, of what it means to be desperately hungry here. We, when we read or we hear this, this passage, our minds need to go to this place. We need to try to imagine a, a, a time of extreme desperation, extreme deprivation, not just skipping a meal or two, but several days without food or drink. Again, this metaphor would have landed uh, much easier on, on, on Jesus' original audience than, than it does for us. Because for Israel, for the people of Israel, water was in scarce supply. Food sometimes was, was scarce. And they had a history of, of dealing with famine. If you go all the way back to, uh, to Genesis and, and, and look at the story of Joseph, there was a huge famine, a massive famine, and that was a difficult time. About 400 years before Jesus was born, probably about the time that we say the 400 years of silence started, um, Rome experienced an awful famine. 
one of the worst. It was so severe that thousands of people threw themselves into the Tiber River to drown rather than to starve to death. That's how bad it was. Even within the last hundred years, despite all of our, all of our agricultural advances and, and all of our efforts, there are still, over the last hundred years, tens of millions of people who have starved to death or have died from, from complications that, that arise from, from malnutrition. And so we need to do our best. I know it's hard, but to, to, to enter that mentality, enter, you know, imagine that kind of hunger, a painful hunger, a hunger that knows that if you don't get something to eat, you are not going to make it. You are going to die. A starving person, a starving person has a single, all-consuming passion for food, right? That's their goal. They just want food. And Jesus isn't just talking to hunger. He says, he says thirst too, right? So the same goes for thirsty, during World War I, there were these allied forces, the British, the Australians, and the New Zealand soldiers. They set out to liberate Palestine from the Turks. And as the Turks retreated uh, from the desert, the allied forces pursued them. And as they pursued them northward, the allies were running out of water and they were out distancing their, their water supply. And eventually, when they ran out of water, they were they, they, they all had real dry mouths, they got real bad headaches, they were getting dizzy, they were fainting, they had swollen and purple lips, uh, they were seeing mirages all the time. I mean, it was, it was a terrible experience, and they knew that if they could not make it to, to this place called the Wells of Sharia by nightfall, thousands of them would die, adding to the hundreds who already had died. And fighting at this point for what they knew was their own survival, they get to these wells of Sharia and they manage to drive the Turks back out of Sharia where there was plenty of water. There were huge cisterns of water there. And as the water was being distributed to the allied forces, those more able body were supposed to step back and wait their turn while the wounded and those who were about to, to go on guard got their drinks first. And it's reported that the last person to receive his drink it took four hours for him to get that drink. It took four hours for them to, to, to give all these other guys a drink before he got his. And I want you to imagine that during those four hours, he was standing no more than 20 feet away from thousands of gallons of water. Thousands of gallons of water. The water that he had been passionately and desperately desiring for days. And I think these stories accurately depict the type of hunger and thirst that Jesus is talking about. The weight of these words to, to hunger and thirst should be felt as ones of desperation and survival. It's about survival. These people were, were, were empty. They needed filled, right? They needed something. And looking at our, at our uh, Beatitudes, we're coming from a place of, of being spiritually empty. And we're needing to be filled up. Jesus says, you're hungry and thirsty, you've been in the dry desert wandering, you need to be filled. You need to be filled. But he's very particular about what we need to be filled with. He doesn't want us to be filled with junk. He wants us to be a healthy hunger. A very healthy hunger is what he's talking about, right? Like Elvis, we can sometimes hunger after the wrong things. We can be, we, we can consume a whole lot of worldliness. It's easy. That's, I mean, that's right before us, right? And here's the reality, we are created with a longing inside of ourselves. We are created that way. There will always be a hunger and a thirst for something. We are voracious, ambitious, and yet we are empty. And we want to fill that emptiness. Everybody wants to fill that emptiness that they may feel. There may be, uh, th th you know, there's got to be something out there, something that can fill me up. And most people look for this in the wrong places. They look to be filled up to cure their emptiness in the wrong places. It's, it's the wrong things, the wrong food, right? Things that are bad for our spiritual health, devastating to our hearts and to our souls. And sometimes it's in the form of, of alcohol or drugs, um, in, in the form of physical companionship. Um, our hunger and thirst can temporarily be, be quenched by money or, or success or things or social identity, you know, the number of friends that we have or, or how many likes we get on our, 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 our social media stuff. But Jesus tells us those things are, those don't satisfy. That's not the food that you ought to be looking for. That's not the food I want for your soul. 
he tells us that the object of our hunger and thirst must be righteousness. That has to be the object of, of what we hunger for, what we thirst for. It has to be righteousness. And because Christ declares that hunger for righteousness is essential to our spiritual health, we need to carefully consider what he's talking about. What is this righteousness? Because there are several different forms of righteousness in Scripture that's talked about, and many have supposed that this is what we call an objective righteousness, described in the book of Romans, that, that God reckons to the believer's account, something we call imputed righteousness, uh, uh, where, where we're given Christ's right standing before God. We, a lot of times we would uh, simply call it salvation. So that's one theory of righteousness, but I don't think it's quite a complete idea of what Jesus is talking about here. Others would say they w- that they would consider this to be a social righteousness, which is the good and just treatment of oppressed people, and that is a good thing, that's a good righteousness, and it's certainly included in, in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus spends a, a few paragraphs there talking about social righteousness, but not yet, not yet, and I don't think that that's the complete picture. The root meaning here in Matthew 5, 6 should actually be determined by the seven other occurrences I- of the word righteousness within the Sermon on the Mount, and sometimes... This is how we have to do it sometimes. In order to find the most accurate interpretation of a word or a particular text, we need to look outside of the text itself. We need to get away from that verse and look at the verses that surround it, right? We go out in concentric circles. We, we hit the verses around it, and then we hit, you know, other times that the author uses this particular word. And then we look at other times uh, this word occurs in all of Scripture and, and try to put it all together. And, and rather than an objective righteousness or a social righteousness, Jesus appears to be talking about something that we call a subjective righteousness, a righteousness that works itself out in our living in conformity to God's will. The word that he uses here, the Greek word for righteousness, literally means right living. Right living. Which would mean that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those who long to live righteously, to live right according to God's standards. And this is a good longing that all things should be lived in line with God's will. Live out his statutes, as Psalm 119 says again and again. And real quick, just to avoid any any misinterpretations here, this righteousness still does not come from us. I need to make that clear. It does not come from us. Understand that you and I, as as, as believers, uh, we have the opportunity to live godly lives, but it's not a godly life produced by self so that we may boast. It's a godly life produced in us by God. We grow in the righteousness received from trusting Christ, and this growth, is, this, this Christian growth, this spiritual growth, is, is something we call sanctification. And what we're talking about specifically here is what would be called progressive sanctification, which is simply the effect of obedience to the Word of God in your life. It's growing in the Lord. It's, it's, it's growing in spiritual materni- <laughs> maternity, maturity, God started the work of making us like Christ. He started that work, and he continues that work through the process of sanctification, looking more and more like Jesus. And the tension here is that this righteousness that Jesus speaks of is both a work of God in us, and yet it is still subject to our decision to live righteously, our decision to live holy, to live godly lives. This is kind of like the, 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 the fruit is the evidence type concept where you know that God is working in your heart and in your life because you can see the fruit of it in your actions and in your, your, your lifestyle. Our desires and our will are being molded by God to more closely l- reflect His desires and His will. We live, how we live is evidence of this work. And we are to hunger and thirst for this, for that righteousness to live it out. We're to long for it. We are to, in the strongest and deepest sense, desire God's incredible working in our life and desire a true obedience to Him. This is healthy hunger. This is what Jesus is talking about. And the last thing about hunger that we need to talk about here is that it needs to be continual. It is a continual hunger. It doesn't stop. King David, at his best, was like this. 
He was like this. He had a relationship with God unlike most. It was a very unique relationship with God. He talks about such lofty spiritual experiences in the Psalms as he writes, and yet he still, he still writes these words. He, he says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That's from Psalm 63.1. And this is the way it ought to be for every believer. This is the way Jesus desires it to be for us. This is the way that, that we ought to live. We should never have enough of God and righteousness in our lives. We should never think that we have had enough. Do not be guilty of personal spiritual self-satisfaction. Personal spiritual self-satisfaction. We can't be satisfied with just a little bit of God in our lives. We can't be satisfied with just a little bit of, uh, of biblical literacy right? We can't be satisfied with just occasional moments of ministry that just fall in our lap and, and, we, and we choose not to do anything else. Satisfied with being a consumer of the work of the church rather than a participant in the work of the church. We can't be the type of people that say, I, I'm perfectly fine where I'm at spiritually. I don't need to grow anymore. Everything, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm where I need to be. And I, I'm going to be frank with you. I mean, we, this is all about honesty and truth, there is no such thing as neutral in the Christian life. You are either in reverse or you are in drive. You're either going backward or you're going forward. We are not ever stationary. We're not ever in one spot. And it's probably by design. That's probably by design. We are either drawing nearer to God or we are slipping further away from God. And if you think that you're somewhere in the middle, that probably means you are sloping downhill. And what that means is, is that we're being less obedient to God or less loving towards him, or less desiring of his ways in, in our lives, less hungry for righteousness, which is a scary thing. And, and sometimes, I mean, I, I, can, I can sympathize with this. Sometimes it's just time that, ju that diminishes our desires. Sometimes it, it's circumstances that, that, that just crush us, and, and, and we were hungry, we were thirsty at the beginning of our walk with Christ. We were but we're fine now, right? We don't need any more of it. It's, it's all right. That's what we tell ourselves sometimes. You know, we, uh, we've lived with Jesus, this, this inexhaustible well, as some call him, for years now, and we feel that we've drawn enough from him, so we live a life of, of, of less of him. And really, anything other than continual hunger is considered lesser and limited devotion to him. Jesus calls this forgetting your first love. Forgetting your first love. Jesus says we should continue to draw from him regularly. Draw from his well. In the Greek language, verbs uh, like hunger and thirst often indicate incompleteness or a partialness. And to be technical, they're, they're called partitive genitive words. And the idea is that a person would only hunger for some food, and they would only thirst for some water, not all the food and water that there is in the world. But it's important to recognize that Jesus didn't use that form of speech when he said hunger and thirst here. He didn't use that form of speech. He used what's called an accusative form of the words hunger and thirst that would come to mean that righteousness is the unlimited object of our hunger and thirst. The unlimited object. Blessed are those who desire all the righteousness there is. All of it. Not just some of it. All of it. People who never want to stop growing and learning and obeying and, and doing good and seeking Him. Of all the places in life that we're told to be content, this is not one of those places. Jesus here is talking about a holy discontentment. We must continue longing to, as, as Quarrel says, live a godly life as much as a starving man longs for his next piece of bread or a parched tongue yearns for a drop of water. When it comes to righteousness, our part is to seek it. God's part is to satisfy. And that brings us into the blessed reward that he speaks of. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. They shall be satisfied. Once again, we have a very strange paradox to deal with. Every time Jesus speaks of beatitude, there is a paradox involved with it. There's more tension in the text. It, su it suggests that those who continually hunger are satisfied. 
Believers are supposed to seek righteousness, always wanting more and never getting all, and, and yet they will be satisfied. How can I be hungry and satisfied at the same time? Satisfied but never satisfied. How can that happen? Full yet empty, content but discontent. So we've run into this point of, of tension. I mean, think about what Jesus says in John chapter 6. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And so what is it that God is talking about? What is Jesus talking about here? If we're not to hunger and thirst, why are we to hunger and thirst? There's tension. And I think that this Jesus statement in the, in the book of John means to show us that, that there is nowhere and no one else that, uh, other than him that can satisfy the hunger and thirst that we feel in this life. There is no one else. He's the well that does not run dry. He's, he's the bread that does not run out. The word satisfied in our text this morning is pronounced hortazo in the Greek, and it's frequently used uh, when it comes to feeding animals. That's what they, they, would, they would talk about feeding animals until they wanted nothing more, until they were completely full, to feed until completely full. And that's the word that's used here, eat until you are full. Jesus' promise here is that if we hunger and we thirst for righteousness, we will be given total satisfaction. We will be full. But I think that we ought to look at this in order to truly understand it, we ought to look at it as a meal, because Jesus uses this metaphor, hunger and thirst. He, he's, he's talking about eating and drinking. He's using that metaphor, and, and so I'll explain it this way. It's no secret that I love a good ribeye. Oh, man. There is no greater steak, in my opinion. In my ideal meal, my wife makes the best ribeye. And my ideal meal would be her thick-cut ribeye that she prepares, Paula's potatoes, Judy's Jello, <laughs> and a slice of key lime pie. And wash that down with cherry Coke. I am golden. I am satisfied, right? That would be the most satisfying meal I could possibly conjure up myself. And yet, just having it once, I don't think I'd settle for it, right? Not just once. I've had a taste for it. I want some more. I want it again, right? I may be satisfied by it, and because I am satisfied by it, I would want to continue. I would continue to long for that meal, Right? You put meatloaf in front of me, it's like, now I want the ribeye again. That's what I want. I would want to eat that again. I've had a taste, and it, it would just be this cycle. It would be this cycle. It is the very satisfaction that it gave me that makes me want more of it. Right? I would want to eat that meal more often because it satisfied so well. And then we plug that into the spiritual equation here that we're talking about. The person who genuinely hungers and thirsts for righteousness finds it so satisfying that he wants more and more of it. I'll put it to you this way. The more you conform to God's will, the more fulfilled and content you become. But then that in turn spawns a greater discontent, our hunger increases in the very act of being satisfied. Bernard of Clairvaux, in his hymn, Jesus, Thou Joy of Loving Hearts, writes, We taste thee, O thou living bread, and long to feast upon thee still. This is the attitude that Jesus is looking for from his believers, from his followers. And remember, that's, that's the point of the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, he's looking for followers. God satisfying those who, who seek and love him and, and seek and love his ways is a repeated theme throughout the scriptures, specifically in the Psalms. You know, one in particular reads, for he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Jeremiah, God says in Jeremiah 31, 14, my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. May we be satisfied again and again and hunger more and more. You are what you eat is a crucial truth in the spiritual sense. And the tragedy of our time is that not only does the world hunger and thirst after wealth and violence or physical pleasures or excitement, but so do many in the church. Our diets sometimes leave us as empty as the world. And a couple of things here as I close to help us examine our hearts and, and know where to go for, for, for this food, for this water, I'll start with saying 
if you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, as Jesus says we ought to, first place you ought to look is his word. Feed on his word. Scripture is the spiritual food that he provides. That is our daily bread. Get in his word. I wish we all at every moment in our lives would have Jeremiah's zeal for God's word when he rejoiced. He said, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. One psalmist wrote, my soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. The point is you don't have to beg a hungry man to eat. We have it right in front of us. Our nourishment and our delight and our joy and our satisfaction can be found in the pages of Scripture. And if you don't have a Bible, if you're someone in here that doesn't have a Bible, look in the chair in front of you. Look underneath the chair in front of you. Take that one home because we got plenty of them. Take that home and, and read, dig in, dive into it. You can know what righteous living looks like as you study his word. The next thing, as John MacArthur describes it, he says, find pleasantness in the things of God. He goes on to say that the believer who seeks God's righteousness above all other things will find fulfillment and satisfaction even in those things that humanly are disastrous. Thomas Watson once said, one, the, the one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness can feed on the myrrh of the gospel as well as the honey. Myrrh is, is bitter, honey is sweet. You can, you can feed on the bitterness and the sweetness. It all is satisfying to you. And even reproof and discipline in the life of the believer will bring satisfaction. It'll bring joy even because we know that that is a sign of the Father's love for us, as Hebrews 12, 6 tells us. And then lastly, if you are spiritually hungry, that hunger must be marked by unconditionality which Microsoft Word says is not a word, but it is. I looked it up. When we genuinely hunger and we genuinely thirst we, for, for righteousness, we, we don't make conditions for it. We don't make conditions. A starving man accepts the food that is offered to him. We seek and accept God's righteousness in whatever way he chooses to provide it, and we accept his standards for godly living regardless of how high that bar is set. God doesn't move the bar down just because it's going to be difficult. Understand that. If he were going to do that, Jesus' life and death would be irrelevant to us. Jesus is the only one who lived a perfectly pleasing life to God. He's the only one that never sinned. He's the only one that reached that bar. He's it. And as we live more and more like Jesus, as we're conformed more and more to his image, then we ought to be getting closer and closer to that bar, understanding that there will still be failures, and in our failures before God, Christ will lift us up to it, but he will never lower it. His standards do not change. And it's my genuine prayer for each of us, for all of us, that we would continuously and passionately seek righteousness, that we would seek to live out a godly life to train ourselves up in godliness, as Paul wrote to Timothy. That we would be desperate for God and, and, and find that he is good to fill us up. And I'm going to end with a quote from one of my favorite worship songs that says, Let living water satisfy the thirsty without price. Come eat of him our living bread. All glory be to Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again just for this day where we can gather together as a church family for the purpose of worshiping you. I'm thankful, Lord, for each and every person who's here this morning. And from the depths of our hearts, may it be this morning that our worship was pleasing to you, that our songs and our prayers and, and the teachings were, were good to encourage and, and to build up your people and to please you. And, and Lord, we just thank you for your word this morning. My hope is that we are coming to an accurate understanding of what you intend to communicate to us and that we are taking your word to heart. Lord, give us a tenacious desire to follow you and live according to your will. Let us continue to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Don't let our passion wane. Don't let us sink into self-satisfaction, Lord. May we constantly be reminded of you, our first love. Let us continue to grow into better reflections of who you truly are. May our actions 
and our attitudes and our words be informed by your standard for right living. And may we apply your word today to our lives every day. Fill us up, Lord. May we be satisfied by living water and let our cups overflow. It's in your name we pray. Amen.